there might be um, like ways to politically engineer it. Let's say I have like swap lines and then the respective country just buys stuff from China. Yeah, so that's what we've seen in, in cases uh, this year with, uh, I think we saw with Argentina and maybe even Pakistan, uh, where uh, they, uh, in some ways, so this is, uh, so what, what these countries did, right, they were running out of dollars, they're financially strapped, and they need to, uh, they, they still need to pay for their goods from China. Uh, and so what they do is they use the swap line, that is China says, we'll give you RMB, and you pay okay. us back this RMB in a short period of time. And uh, we'll take your currency as a deposit in exchange for that in the meantime. And then the, uh, it's almost like producer finance, China says, We'll, we'll loan you RMB. You buy our goods, uh, which which uh, ha so a couple of things occur to me about it. First, it's a bit like lemon socialism. Mm -hmm. We call lemon socialism, where it's a failed company, a failed as an emergency situation, and that's when they find the employers find it in their heart to let the uh, employees have shares in the company, right? And so this is the sort of the same kind of way that. Uh, uh, I'm in Argentina. I've run out of dollars. I've got a very, very few dollars. I need those dollars to pay the IMF for some other purposes. Uh, but I still, I still need to buy these goods from China, and so I'll, I'll borrow money from China. Now, I'd say that this is a case not of supplanting the dollar, but sort of supplementing the liquidity. Uh, and and again, the the challenge though is uh, think about like uh, you're the uh, you're Argentina uh, or Brazil, and you've uh, You've got dollar bonds out there. You've you've borrowed dollars, mm -hmm. and now if you're just going to accept RMB as your source of revenue for the goods you sell abroad. You have a mismatched book, and that book of so you're selling your so you, uh, it's sort of like uh, uh, same thing with uh, Saudi Arabia, right? They uh, they they peg their currency the dollar, which means when the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates later this month. Uh, Saudi, the Saudi monetary authority is going to have to raise interest rates. Uh, they so they're pegged to the dollar. They get dollar primarily for the goods that they sell. And so then what happens? They're going to take on RMB, and then it gives them a currency they have to manage, as opposed to just doing everything in dollars. And so uh, you you end up running a mismatch of a book of your like assets and liabilities in different currencies, which makes it, uh, which maybe is also maybe a point you're, you're making too, is that there's a bit of inertia behind it, behind the role of the dollar. And then not that and that it's not that it's impossible, but just that it's going to take more thinking about it and maybe a bit longer to change the inertia to so begin borrowing, begin having then uh, Saudi Arabia, maybe that's something else China can do, is encourage foreign countries to issue what we call panda bonds, RMB bonds in China. Right. That would, that's an interesting that's an interesting one. <laughs> And, and um, that's, really, that's why I think that, like, when we're thinking about the, the capital markets, why I think that there's some ideas that maybe the dollar could be replaced by some kind of commodity backed currency, whether it's gold or a basket of commodities. And there's something about it that's intuitively like desirable, something that you can touch. I mean, that's the whole idea what fiat means, right? It's not backed by gold or silver. Uh, on the back of my dollar bill says, you know, it's, uh, it's like legitimate tender. Uh, that means that I can, I, anybody who I owe dollars to should has to take that, my legal tender. Uh, but uh, but we know it's not really backed by anything, except like it's almost like a confidence game. And so imagine a currency, I think many of us would, would have more faith, higher confidence in a currency that we know is backed by something. But here's the challenge with that, is that the, the foreign exchange market is an incredible turnover. And the place we could get this data is from the Bank for National Settlements. They have a survey every three years about the size of the foreign exchange market. Average daily turnover, over seven and a half trillion dollars. Seven and a half trillion dollars a day. It's just mind boggling what that is compared to like any of these commodities you wanna measure, whether it's soy, gold, aluminum, even all of the world's trade in a year. Is no more than say 50, 60 billion, uh, 60 trillion dollars. We do that in in ten days in the foreign exchange market. The world's GDP is roughly speaking a hundred trillion dollars a year. We do that in a month in the foreign exchange market. And that's just one segment of the capital markets. And so I just think that what's happened in that Reagan Thatcher era that we still sort of are living in the aftermath of created these huge financial superstructures. 
of a place to store this surplus savings uh, of this like great wealth of our not just of our time but of all of our like all of humanity all the wealth we don't just store it in museums, but a lot of the wealth is in liquid form, dollars, euros. It's in stocks. It's in bonds. And that's what we're really trading. That's the store of our, that's where we put our our savings for that rainy day. And for the way we are different places in our life, people close to retirement maybe have more savings than people right out of school, where they put that savings until they need to use it. And so that, that, that financial superstructure, where we put all the savings, has... That's like if you look at it as a uh, as a balance sheet. There's assets on it, and there's there's liabilities. There's assets and there's debt. And so many people talk about well, there's too much debt in the world. That to me is another way of saying there's too much savings in the world. And so I don't see how commodities at current prices, I mean, say gold two thousand dollars an ounce or so, I don't see that being anywhere big enough to really uh, supplant. Or even supplement in a very significant way this financial this 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 uh, sort of superstructure of finance that's been created. That that's fascinating, Mark. Like, what else are these days on your mind in terms of um, you know currencies or um, or kind of re related kind of like market? There's like you know there's a lot of talk about this deglobalization, obviously. That's like a one thing Then I, I, you are very, um, I think like you, you made several times the point that um, you don't think that it was because China um, entered the WTO mm -hmm. and that, that that's why you have like a lot of is issues in the US and, uh, you know, in the, in the um, Rust Belt and so on and so forth. So, and you think this is like internal kind of weakness, right? So in, in other words, we just like, point, we just discussed, okay, so we have internal it's pretty much an internal issue of the U.S. If the U.S. decides um, to let the dollar go in this kind of function with this kind of um, way, then it can, it's probably, it's going to happen. So what would you say when we talk a little bit more about, um, okay, we have a U.S. economy um, that's weak through maybe like part of the structure of what, where the U.S. dollar is right now, like, can you just guide us through a little bit on the, okay, so we have this um, China entering the WTO, a lot of kind of talk has been done up to today, um, US quite weak um, domestically, like wh what do, where did this leave us? Yeah, so I, I kind of think that uh, people who advocated free trade and including China joining the WTO, I think that when you really look at the literature, I think that they really recognize that there are going to be some winners and losers. But that there was this uh, perhaps uh, naive, uh, but there was the belief that the winners would still compensate the losers. Hmm. And so I kind, of, I kind of think that what's happened is that the, what I would say is this uh, unwritten social contract was broken. That in the late 70s, the... Uh, uh, we were in a crisis. We had some of that economists that couldn't, it couldn't happen. That is very weak, stagnant economies and high inflation. And how did we solve that? But that and that's where Reagan and Thatcher come along. And partly it was breaking that social contract. And that social contract, the base of that social contract was that wages would keep pace with inflation or productivity. That was the underlying basis of it. And I think that the social contract broke and uh, at the same time that they, so they broke the social, so for me, if I would say the story was really capital went on the offensive, trying to get out of that crisis of the 70s. And as they went on this, uh, this, uh, this advance, this uh, uh, offensive, deregulate the capital markets, letting capital move around the world, deregulate, there used to be an interest rate cap in the US, right. get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, weaken uh, organized labor. And uh, I think that that, uh, so to me, the, the, the it's not that China got into the WTO, it's that the Americans, but other countries too, where you see the, say the Gini ratio, this uh, mm. income distribution yeah, quickly, became yeah. more skewed in most of the advanced industrialized countries. But I think that, that's because of political decisions made more than uh, making room at the table for China. I mean, I think about, uh, 
it's fortunate uh, our generation hasn't had to have a global war. But what was it, World War One, and maybe some historians now these days they call it, talk about the Great War. Partly, what was that about? It wasn't just about uh, sort of the story that the, sort of the there's a subtext to what we've probably been told, and that subtext is who is going to replace the UK as the hegemonic power in the world. And was it going to be uh, Germany and the U.S. roughly were passing up the U.K. say steel production or railroad uh, mileage land, you know, laid, uh, replacing Germany and we're replacing the U.K. And so it was a question of where, uh, who's going to be the next hegemonic power? And I, I think that by not making room at the table, which I think is sort of uh, where we so end of World War One. Can we make room for the table for a, Germ a defeated Germany? And I think Keynes was, I mean, Keynes's economic consequences of peace, I think is very relevant uh, today as we think about how and how and what we demand from Russia uh, for ending the war. Uh, do, we con do we confiscate their reserves and repurpose them? Uh, do we bleed? Do we bleed Russia the way that uh, Keynes thought that we were going to bleed Germany? And uh, so I, I'm like, so within this context then of, uh, uh, again, back to the, the U.S. and this breaking of the social, con the social contract domestically, uh, that so we can have free trade, we can make room at the table for China if we have strong domestic institutions and pol politics that allow for this. But I don't think that's the case. And so I think that leaves the middle class and working class uh, very vulnerable to these shifting tides. Uh, but so I'm, I, but I'm not sure that they. I mean, we, we, you know, that this globalization is really the key here. I mean, I think about like uh, Adam Smith writes the book, right? We're all familiar with the Wealth of Nations, and he, mm. he takes people through a tour of a of a pin factory and he, to really illustrate the division of labor. And uh, Keynes writes about uh, as a British man of of his age uh, how he can order things from all around the world and have them delivered in the UK. Now Milton Friedman did it uh, with his, his wife Rose Friedman. They did a, uh, uh, they took people through a pe manufacture of pencil, the global division of labor. I think that uh, people in the United States uh, they, uh, they they benefit uh, greatly from having cheap products produced overseas. It helps us uh, combat when our bosses aren't giving us raises. It helps keep the American standard of living that we could acquire things, buy things, part of this American dream, cheaper than we could otherwise. And I think that many people say, well, China shouldn't have joined the WTO. That was like a that was like a, the Trojan horse, if you will. I, I, I think that we, we don't think about the next step. What would the world been like? Uh, it wouldn't have just been status quo. Uh, China would have done China still would have been growing, expanding, perhaps without the guidelines, even as mild as they are, of the WTO. But I, I think that you know this globalization is uh, what we think of globalization is a, very much of an American creation, a foreign direct investment, uh, McDonald's in Red Square, mm. you know, uh, or, uh, McDonald's or uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken or uh, uh, Starbucks in uh, Tiananmen Square in Beijing, you know, that um, this is what we I think we mean by globalization uh, that's so peculiar to America, fast food. Uh, and I, I think that the uh, we can have it. We, we should be able to be creative enough, imaginative enough to imagine another type of globalization, the type of globalization that our grandparents had. People didn't have visas and passports. Global migration, people moved at huge numbers, and now we're sort of choking on them. And it's been, of course, a political issue in the U.S., political issues in Europe about immigration and refugees. There's different types of globalization. We've had other types of globalization. But I think that some of the, uh, you think about what's happened, say, roughly 1950 to roughly 2000. This globalization was uh, lifted, I mean, uh, world GDP. You think about even in China, this access to global markets, GDP per capita went up something on the magnitude of eight to tenfold in China from, say, 1980 to 2000. The, the abject poverty, I mean, in some ways, I would suggest that would not that of course there's exceptions to this rule uh, in t big parts of Africa, parts of uh, South America, parts of East Asia, and even parts uh, very rural parts in America where uh, don't have access to electricity. But the kind of penetration rate of cell phones, for example, is just 
is just incredible. Uh, the penetration of computers. Uh, so a lot of these technologies uh, that came about because of the uh, liberalization of the capital markets, uh, I think about like the breaking up of AT&T, the internet might be hard to conceptualize if the AT&T monopoly wasn't broken up. And so uh, I, I want to say that in the sort of tradition of, of Marx, you know, M Marx argued that he hated capitalism, but he also recognized that it was the best system up to that point. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that like um, this whole deglobalization uh, debate is a little bit um, kind of misunderstood because it, it's just becoming a little bit more strategic, as you said, right? It's just like there's a, it's not only capital that's deciding what's best, doesn't matter if like, you know, um, people, capital moves, um, these kind of trade po policies, but it's really about there's like a bigger layer of decision making that now comes into play as well, which makes everything just a little bit more strategic, which will have effects, but like, we are not going back. So, um, yeah, I, I think that maybe what you're getting at is uh, it's almost like this a gravity model that instead of thinking about globalization as if it's evenly distributed around the world, think about like strong regions, like in the US, for example, the West Coast and the East Coast, a few hundred miles of, on each, each side of the country, that produces a, an incredible percentage of our GDP. And so uh, um, it's, it's not globalization. I mean, the interior of Brazil uh, might not be so integrated in the global economy. The southern part of Mexico might not be, but the northern part is. Uh, and so you look, I, I think that we might find that globalization was always really about regionalization. And now to your point, it becomes more, uh, more uh, thoughtful about why it is that way. Right. Mark, before we wrap this up, where can people apart from Cassandra follow your work? I mentioned a few <laughs> sources already. <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, my, my employers, uh, since the advent, I'd say, I don't know, last uh, 20 years almost, my employers have been very generous and allow me to post uh, the work that I do for them and their clients online. And there's a blog uh, called Mark to Market, uh, which is Mark with a C, the way the French would spell it. Uh, uh, marktomarket.com and I tend to post things about six times. I used to do seven days a week. Now I'm back down to six days a week. Uh, but it's, it's, it's supposed to really uh, give a good uh, overview of what's going on with the macro interest capital markets and with a special focus of trying to like look through the world, look at the world through the prism of the foreign exchange market, uh, which I think is like a window glass as opposed to looking through the equity market, which might be more like a a keyhole. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle there is uh, Mark Making Sense, and that's really a play on the title of the first book I wrote, uh, Mark Ma of uh, Making, Making Sense, Sense of the of dollar. dollar. Yeah, and which is just a you know I wrote it like 20 years into my career, and sort of saying these are what I used to think about the foreign exchange market. I call them myths, and I take about 10 of them, and I say now why the why the the truth is either completely different or more complicated uh, than sort of than the naive assumption that I had earlier in my career. And then out of that book, I had introduced this I, this idea that I've mentioned here too about surplus. And it's really this tradition uh, going back to the 19th century. But I, I really go back to this a guy named Charles Conant, who was a banker and a journalist who ended up working at Brown Brothers, where I spent about 15 years of my career. He was there at the turn of the century, the early 1900s. And I think that uh, uh, well, I suggest that he sort of brought uh, 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 he sort of anticipated he brought Marx and anticipated Keynes into the U.S. And I'd say that he proposed to the U.S. in the early 1900s that we have a Belt Road Initiative mm -hmm. uh, that I'd say China sort of copied from us in a way. But uh, so it's called Political Economy of Tomorrow. And I really developed this idea of this uh, Brenton Woods, I call it a cash register, a, Mar uh, a Thatcher, a Reagan cash register. And I'm trying to see what are the, uh, what's the shape of the new cash register. And that book came out in between uh, the, the Bear Stearns being taken over in uh, early 2008 and Lehman failing in late 2008. Uh, so that, that book came out, uh, it was written during that period. And uh, so I was able to anticipate some things, the rise of nationalism, uh, the import substitution strategy. And I, I'd say it's, uh, I'm working on the next volume, the sort of what, what, where are we now, sort of post-COVID, post-Russian invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. And I'll, I'll give you a sense that I'm kind of thinking that capitalism has so advanced that economics, the uh, the economic argument that something's going to be more profitable or economically efficient, I think it carried the day. 
Interesting. Uh, but now I, I think it no longer will. I think there's other concerns like um, national security, uh, ESG, right? It's environment, social, uh, government. I think that becomes just as important as how fast can I make my money back is sort of the, uh, uh, I, I think other issues, social justice issues, that capitalism is so advanced. And, and I, I, I would say that like in my work, if there was some like uh, parallel, I kind of think that what I've been struggling with is to, and telling it in many different ways, but it's always the same story, unfortunately, sort of like modernizing the King Midas myth. Remember King Midas? Uh, yes. He, he employs the gods and they, and what do the gods do when they want to really hurt somebody? They give them what they wanted. He wanted everything he touched to turn to gold. It sounded nice when he touched a tree on his way home, but then he tried drinking some wine and hugging his daughter. And of course the outcome wasn't nearly as good. And so I think that we, our, our species, and of course, it's uh, this vast inequality in the world. But so I'm really thinking about the U.S., Europe, the high income parts of the world. I think we're really choking on our wealth. And you see it like the plastic in the oceans. Uh, you see a lot of other way, other measures of this, uh, of us having too much and not knowing what to do with the waste of it, let alone consuming it all. And so... Uh, uh, so, yeah, so my, my idea for where we are this next phase, I, I'm sort of tentatively be calling it the end of economic primacy. Interesting. That's very interesting. When is that coming out? Is there already a date? No, I'm, I'm, it's, 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 it's still on the drawing board. I'm, I'm in the middle of it. Well, third of it. Fantastic. We're going to have you back on then and, and discuss this. I, I do believe that there is like a lot of doctrine and a lot of different kind of um, ways how um, you know, how people think, especially um, younger people, as it seems, as around the world, not only the Western world. Um, so there might be some change in the coming. Mark, thank you so much for, you know, sitting down. Um, absolute pleasure. Um, I learned a lot. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Cheers. Well, thank you. Thank you. Good luck to everybody.